since she isn't on, then we don't have a vote, so then we can't actually progress if we want. Recording has started. Thanks, Ray. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, another edition of the TSC. Um, you, you've all had a few moments to read the antitrust policy notice here. Uh, and as always, we want to mention that everyone is welcome in the TSC uh, meeting. If you have any thoughts or opinions, uh, please feel free to uh, just sort of shout those out during this meeting. Uh, we have a relatively light topic today. Uh, you should have all seen that um, on the TSC agenda that was sent out. Uh, we have a few announcements, uh, a couple quarterly report outs, uh, a couple discussion items, and uh, one topic that is not on here that we wanted to discuss is just how we uh, continue to manage um, the project updates moving forward in a more efficient fashion, uh, in particular as we uh, have more working groups and more uh, projects coming into the Hyperledger umbrella. Uh, so with that, I will ha hand it off to uh, Salona and uh, Tracy for any announcements. Hi, so the main one is uh, uh, recruiting for internships. We're still looking for mentors. Uh, we're gonna open it up for the actual interns um, next month. But for right now, we're looking for the internships. All that's set up on the wiki and things can be proposed through that. We're also gonna be automating a little bit more of that on the wiki going forward as well. Uh, the quilt architecture reboot process officially got started yesterday, um, where all the different calendar times have now been reserved on the calendar. So everyone can go and sign up for those um, that are interested. And um, super sad, uh, Tracy's last day is the 12th but she's still gonna be a lab steward and I'm still gonna be recruiting her to be on the um, uh, uh, technical ambassadors. So, um, yes. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Oh yeah, I wanna personally extend a thank you. You've done a great job representing the community uh, and I know that you've been a huge help uh, in many of the projects. So really appreciate your contributions over the past, uh, past year or so. Thanks, all. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, so because we want to uh, make sure we get through the project updates, we are going to be uh, moving these uh, towards the top of the agenda um, for, for this week's meeting and also uh, from here on out. So uh, is there anyone from the Hyperledger Fabric uh, team that would like to uh, briefly talk through the Hyperledger project, Fabric project update? So we haven't coordinated this, but I guess I could do it if there's nobody else. Yeah, that would be great. We'd appreciate that, Arno. All right, so Chris filled out the report. I don't know if he had planned to be on the call to give the report, and that's what I mean by we have not had any coordination. But I think, you know, overall, it's pretty straightforward. There is no major issue. I think he really knows we had the first major release in terms of long-term support. It's the first long-term support release. Uh, it was scheduled for the end of December because of the holidays. We actually had a candidate release before the holidays, but then we kind of froze there. And It's only early January that we actually released 1.4, but more or less we are, still, we are still on schedule with regard to our quarterly release schedule. And so the work has now for, you know, shifted towards, now we have two versions we're working on, 1.4.1, which will be the patch release for 1.4 and 2.0, which has a bunch of new features. Um, in terms of, you know, um, the overall um, uptake and, and the community, nothing really has changed. Uh, Fabric still remains very popular. Um, the contributors are pretty much stable. Uh, we have, um, a pretty steady stream of contribution. And um, there are some major new features that are being worked on. We had actually had an amazing presentation a couple, a few days ago 
of a university from Waterloo that has been working on performance. And so it was quite interesting. I mean, just to give you a highlight, they did a test where they had 3,500 transactions per second, and they were able to move that to up to over 20,000 by making a bunch of optimization. <laughs> so it was quite striking. And it, you know, it really shows the power of open source, right? No matter how big IBM is and how much we put in this and other big organizations, uh, you can still have people like that from the sideline who come up with major breakthrough. So it's very interesting and enlightening. Um, there was one thing that we did in terms of issues that is worth noting. I don't know what that comes from, but so in terms of, um, you know, we're continuing trying to make sure that it's easy for people to join the community of computer. And one issue we have been facing, I don't know who is it calling me, but I hope it's oh, not. That's Kelly. Something's wrong with Kelly's phone, so I, I muted him. All right, thank you. Sorry, Kelly, unmute yourself, you want to talk. So, um, yeah, one issue that has come up with discussions, and I have reported that quite a few times, that you know, for people who are not actively uh, part of the contributors community, it can be quite challenging to get their CR, the change request, looked at or even considered by the maintainers. Part of the issue has to do with the fact that the maintainers are obviously themselves developers and they are busy working on their own. And uh, there's, uh, I think, a little bit of a, you know, the, the, the maintainers are working with one another, making sure that they, they review and merge their own CRs or each other's CRs and all that. If you're not part of the core community of contributors, it, becomes, it can become a bit more difficult to get your CRs reviewed. And so we've talked about it several times. The maintainers have talked about it several times. There was you know, quite a bit of stress put on the fact that maintainers owed to the community to look into the CRs that are standing there. And so to try to improve things, because just begging is not good enough. And by the way, there's, a, also, a, there's also a channel, rocket channel, that people can go to, Fabric PR Review, that I call the beggar's channel, because basically you can go there to beg for attention from maintainers on your CR. But personally, I think you know, this should be a last resort and should be exception, and it becomes the norm. And so we have basically, we're putting a, in place a process uh, that will automatically first nag the maintainers. And at the same time, you know, what happens is them, some people submit CRs and they don't look after them. They don't answer questions from the reviewers. They don't, you know, rebase them. And I know firsthand that can be a pain sometimes. You have to rebase multiple times, but that's part of the game, right? So we also have decided that, you know, after after due warning, uh, if somebody has submitted a CR that is not, and they are not being responsive to comments from the reviewers, after a while, we're just going to drop abandon their CR. So we hope that, you know, this combination of things will help us get rid of the huge backlog of CRs, most of which, you know, cannot be merged because somebody would have to work on at least rebasing them and addressing some of the comments. Um, I think that's pretty much the main crux of what I would want to highlight from the report. I assume everybody can still read, read the report that contains a few more things, but in terms of community, as I said, it's pretty stable. <coughs> Any questions? Arno, that the Garrett policy, I presume, you know, if it if there's a, a CR that actually points to an actual bug um, that you know needs to be fixed, that you know, even if it's old, rather than shutting down the CR, that the developer goes and fixes it, rather than you know, kind of. There's a concern I'd have that that ends up burying bugs or burying otherwise. Well, we are not we are not closing the Jira ticket automatically, right? <laughs> we are we are bundling the CR, which is different. And the CRs not, you know, they can be easily resurrected 
And so there's still, you know, trace of it. It's just a matter of getting rid of the backlog. And oh, the backlog in CR. Okay. The, yeah, yeah. So presumably somebody else, you know, if there is a real bug, the Jira ticket is still open. At some point, somebody's going to get to do it and, and submit another CR or resurrect the first one and, and work on it to make it, you know, current. All right, are you all able to hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great, sorry about that. Uh, I had the Zoom dial my cell phone, so there were some issues there. Um, I was cut out for a, a few minutes, but it sounds like that was just the uh, wrap up of the uh, Fabric project update, is that right? Yes, unless anybody else has any questions. Uh, just one, one more observation more than a, a question. I, I think it's useful for, for any project at Hyperledger when it's crossing that kind of, you know, major version number threshold, like from a 1.x to a 2.x, to use that kind of moment of backwards incompatibility, like tolerance for backwards incompatibility, to take a look at what the other frameworks are doing or other projects at Hyperledger and look for places for where combining efforts might be helpful or picking up things that other projects have been doing, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if any of that happened, has been happening in the move to Fabric 2.0, um, but uh, I, it would be nice <laughs> if there's still a moment to get in some, some something that changes something architecturally. Um, uh, and I don't have any specific notion of what, just uh, you know, knowing that there'd be some curiosity on the part of the Fabric developers towards others might be, might be reassuring. I don't know of any specific plans to break backwards compatibility for that matter, but no, you know, I mean, the, the only, there are a couple of future point of convergence that I see. There's URSA, this is the most obvious one. And of course we have the fabric borough uh, chain code work. We had the first initial release published two weeks ago or so. And, but that's no, you know, that doesn't break anything. It just adds to the offering. Unrelated to the notion of um, Silas here, um, unrelated to the notion of uh, 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 combining architecture when breaking stuff, um, but on the, the, the Fabric EVM and Burrow relationship, um, I think we've both found bugs in each other since the last, certainly since the last review. So uh, we noticed that um, Fabric EVM were throwing away EVM results, um, and then Swetha um, has, has found a bug in uh, the EVM with, with uh, memory uh, return. Pointers. So that was nice. Good. I'm sure know, I think this, kind of, this uh, kind of work obviously is beneficial to all, there's no doubt. I was going to say, it might sound funny for other people, <clears throat> for us celebrating finding bugs in each other's code, but it actually is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that is the first time that it's, it's definitely that it's flowed both ways, but so that's cool. That's great. All right, great. Uh, do we have anyone on from Hyperledger Indie for uh, their project update? We do. Um, it's my turn to get the project update this time. This is Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, feel free to go ahead. All right. Um, the Hyperledger Indie project has grown a lot um, since the last quarter. Um, we have uh, two use cases that have gone live on Sovereign's instance of Hyperledger Indie, the Sovereign mainnet. Um, and are doing a, a few million credentials um, in production now. And um, we've seen a lot of growth, particularly in the agent side of the code base in standardizing the agent protocol, which is what we call the edge protocol that allows one identity owner to talk to another identity owner securely. Um, and there has been a lot of um, new project specification work going on in that space and a lot of new code coming online. Here in February, the Sovereign Foundation is hosting what we call an agent connectathon at the Provo office. And we have organizations from all over coming to test their agent implementations against one another to finalize some of that protocol standardization work and help make that um, move forward much quicker. Um, as part of that, there's been a lot of stability 
fixes in the main ledger. And there have been a lot of code changes around the agent code base and the SDK. We are now to, well, we're almost finished with the 1.8 release of the SDK. And we're working on the move from the Indie Crypto component to switch over to Hyperledger Ursa. Um, there have been a lot of challenges associated with that. Um, we have not finished all of the CII badge initiative requirements. Um, they're all, all the changes have been merged into the code base to meet the CII badge requirements, but we've been having trouble getting some of the build system pieces um, in place to make it so that the code coverage requirements are fully met. Um, I believe all the pull requests for that have been merged, but we've had some infrastructure issues getting the um, regular run of code coverage happening um, on a continuous or automated basis. Um, in terms of project health, um, we have had a, um, we had a maintainer that um, switched job responsibilities and is not as active now, but we were able to add um, several new contributors as well as a couple of new maintainers to help backfill that effort. And that transition has gone very smoothly and we're seeing um, increased progress with the enthusiasm of those contri new contributors and maintainers. Um, we also should um, call out that the Indie Catalyst project has made a lot of um, progress towards moving into the main Indie code base, um, and that work is ongoing. And we've also started work reaching out to the Street Cred ID folks who are also doing some very good work around um, agent implementations in .NET with the Xamarin framework. Um, and we are working to propose a new agent wallet project um, because of the growth in the Indie code base. It makes sense to move that into its own project that would be able to directly attack cross ledger compatibility and um, edged um, issues like cryptographic key management. Um, and we expect that that, that, pro that pro project proposal is being drafted now and we expect that we'll, we'll set that before the TSC sometime after our release that depends on Hyperledger Ursa instead of Indie Crypto. Um, I mentioned previously that we have had some problems with um, builds. We have been in, for quite some time, we've been moving the build infrastructure out of Evernim's um, corporate infrastructure. Um, they've been kind of the primary developers early on of the, of the system. Um, and we've had some problems with that build system not being as visible or editable from the community's perspective as we'd like. Um, we've had tr some trouble moving a lot of those pieces to Hyperledger infrastructure. In particular, a lot of the edge protocol work we do around agents um, requires Android and iOS build support. And so it's taken us quite a bit of time to set up some of that infrastructure as, a, as the sovereign foundation. Um, where we're a nonprofit, our bandwidth can be rather limited. So. Um, that's um, slowed some of the graduation from incubation proposals and some of the other things that we've been working on. Um, with the new build work going on around Hyperledger Ursa, I think we have some strategy for um, fixes to some of the issues that we've been seeing generally in Indy. Um, and I'm hoping that we can move more of that infrastructure over to Hyperledger going forward. Um, finally, um, it's worth noting in the build or in the project report, um, we have notes on the different releases that happened since the last, um, the last update. And we are getting close to various 2.0 efforts inside of the Indy project. Um, first, because of the move over to Ursa and um, some new API functionality in the wallets and a few other places, um, we expect that Indy SDK will be having a 2.0 release um, because we're following semantic versioning. Um, here before the next quarterly report. And the work on the Ledger 2.0 design has started, um, though we don't think any of the major teams working on Indy are going to be resourcing that in the next one or two months before the next project report. We expect that our main 2.0 effort will have stood up and that will be doing a lot of building on top of the shared um, agent wallet um, project that we hope to propose once we move over to Ursa as well as um, doing a lot more work with the integration that Ursa provides. Um, we've also had a lot of discussions with the Sawtooth folks and a few others around some of the new sub projects that um, they're hoping to build and the overlap um, that exists there in order to help bring some of the frameworks at Hyperledger closer together. So with that, any questions for me?
this <clears throat> this is all fant fantastic from my point of view um really good work um is there what's the biggest challenge right now for the indie team from from the either the infrastructure or from uh things that that you know hyperledger staff could be doing better to to support your efforts um a lot of the build infrastructure from our side seems very um very focused on what Fabric has been doing in the past. Um, I think that the involvement we've had on the URSA build side has helped shift some of that. Um, we have a lot of client side build requirements because of our focus on the edge protocol for information exchange. Um, and that's been a, an interesting change from kind of the, the blockchain node um, build strategy for most server infrastructure. So some of the things around um, containerized builds work real well for us and some of them um, pose some interesting challenges. Um, the move from the internal build infrastructure at Evernim out to a community-centric build system um, has meant some of the, um, the terminology that Evernim used internally um, conflicted or didn't match up very well with some of the things that we were doing at Hyperledger. And working through that has taken a considerable amount of time. Um, I think compliments go to both Tracy and Rye for their patience in working through a lot of those issues with us. Um, and it's just uh, the amount of turnaround time to set things up has been rather painful because we'll often have to go back and forth for, for several days around understanding the requirements um, or the, the mismatch in requirements that's causing a hang up. Um, and then, you know, when something takes that long in back and forth, often the maintainers will have moved on to something else by the time they can come to a resolution. Yeah, figuring out the right amount of support for builds that we do is something we have to address in the next few months. Um, and and making wise use of internal LF resources versus, you know, various companies that offer build platforms as a, as a service, you know, as something that should be on the table. So we'll take note of that. Um, Another question I have is you guys have done a really good job bringing in other contributors and I know that's um, in no small part to, to your efforts uh, <laughs> and, and advocacy and speaking. Do you think you could characterize like across the maintainers of Indy, um, what percentage of time you spend on recruiting uh, or things that are meta to the development of the code, you know, with, so that if there's some sort of metric, you know, if we could say, you know, to replicate this, and obviously conditions are different, code is different, but um, maintainers should spend some threshold percentage of time on recruiting of additional contributors, additional, um, you know, participants at whatever stage of the pipeline, right? Is there a number? Is it 20%? Is it 60%? You know, and then is it worth it, right, from the leverage you get from more contributors? Um, is it worth it? I would say so. For, from our experience, it's definitely worth it to spend more time on some of the meta um, recruiting of the project itself. I know that um, I spent um, a, a fair number of hours each week talking to the different maintainers and the folks who are looking to become contributors and maintainers in the system. And we've been able to find and discover a lot of issues early in the, in the process. Um, we've had a lot of the same discussions Arno mentioned around pull requests stalling out amongst new contributors. And if you seek out some of those organizations and you have a discussion, maybe to set aside one or two hours a week to have those kinds of discussions with people coming to your community, it appears to make a big difference in getting them onboarded and getting people excited about what's going on. Um, that's not to say we don't have a lot of struggles. Um, you know, like any open source community it can be daunting to, to figure out the terminology and the breadth of what's going on. And as our project has gotten bigger, uh, I would say that I spend more than probably 20% of my time a week. Um, at, with the Sovereign Foundation, we have a little bit of a, a luxury in that um, our, our main focus is building the open source community around the indie platform. So um, I tell the folks working at the Sovereign Foundation that their goal is to build contributors more so than it is to build code. Um, and as a result, they end up building a lot of code, but um, getting a lot more help from those who come into the community than we would otherwise. So um, in, in terms of working at collaborating across the, the system, um, we found that everyone is really friendly and we just have to remember that everyone's also really busy. Um, and keeping that in mind, um, there's been a lot of new opportunities to collaborate. And um, as folks spend the time talking to each other, we've been able to find a lot of things that um, make that investment pay off um, with, with far more benefit than the time we've had to put in.
Okay, and so it's more than 20% for you, um, and I'm sure it's probably more than 50% for you. Um, I just, it's always useful, I think, when talking to a new project considering coming into Hyperledger, or even when looking at an existing project that might have challenges in recruiting new, if we were able to come back and say, you know, I know the temptation is be 100% focused on writing code, and getting code out there that works is an important part of, you know, being able to recruit a larger community, but um, at steady state, 20%, 30% of a maintainer's time, you know, spending that on, on community engagement and recruiting might seem like a big price to pay, but <clears throat> that it pays off in, in the leverage you get uh, and, the, uh, and the distribution. You know, that's, that's a, sorry to pin it down to a number, you know, because it, it, always, it always depends, right? But uh, um, I think what I heard is that it's north of 20%, but that for, an, for, for a maintainer, um, but that it, it's worth it. And from our side, it, it, if you focus that 20% on the things that you're trying to get done, that's where it really does pay off. It's not just about you know, having a checklist of things to do to ask people to help. It's about making it about the important themes and the important goals of the, pro of the project. Okay. I had a question on the, the community piece as well. Uh, I know you guys have a maintainers call. There's also the identity working group. Uh, do you guys host or does the Sovereign Foundation host um, more a user focused call? Uh, so maybe just more consumers of the platform uh, versus those that are necessarily contributing uh, to the core platform? We have in the past. Um, most of that work has gone to more of an offline um, uh, support in the in forum.sovereign.org. Um, and then several of the companies in our ecosystem are doing consulting work and solutions rollouts with various organizations. Um, we're working to um, resurrect some of the user facing support um, structure that we had in the past. Um, we're standing up some more curriculum and um, some more uh, training opportunities around specific industry verticals. Um, we are seeing a lot of motion in the healthcare space. Um, and a lot of work going on in some of the financial um, sectors, and then also the government folks have been doing a lot relative to the, the organization book work that British Columbia has done. So those are kind of the three um, subsets of kind of user-facing community that are to the point where they're doing a lot more talking amongst themselves. And I expect we'll see more infrastructure for that as um, those parts of the community ask for it. Okay, great. And is most of that uh, sort of coordinated and happening through the, the Sovereign Foundation? A lot of that does tend to happen through the Sovereign Foundation. The Hyperledger community for, for, for us has been mostly about the development effort. Um, a lot of the governance framework and business rules work is over on the Sovereign Foundation side. So um, we've tried to closely duplicate the openness um, strategies that we use here at Hyperledger to help facilitate that community staying very so anyone who's interested in either those business rules or legal rules developments that are around some of those industry verticals can join us on um, the sovereign rocket chat server and on um, the forum.sovereign.org where a lot of those discussions um, post updates great thank you that's very useful Are there any other questions on uh, the update? Okay. Uh, the one other topic uh, that I wanted just to discuss uh, very briefly is how we handle these project updates moving forward. Um, so there has been uh, some offline discussion about uh, having the uh, various TSE members and, and other community participants ensure that they read uh, these offline um, and perhaps even going so far as to have a a checkbox for each TSC member um, on the various project updates so that the time can be better spent in the meeting uh, really on asking any questions uh, that, that weren't able uh, to be uh, sort of addressed sort of asynchronously uh, or through confluence. Uh, so I just wanted to open it up uh, to the community here to, to see people's feedback on, you know, do they get value from the read through of the updates uh, or how they would prefer to uh, handle updates moving forward as we have more working groups and more projects. I really like having the updates on Confluence and having them in a consistent place and being able to actually add comments is a fantastic thing. 
Yeah, agreed. Uh, do, you, do you like the idea of sort of having uh, these check boxes for the, the TSC members to uh, signal that they've read it? Do you think that uh, that should just be a presumed assumption? Just kind of curious um, folks' thoughts on, on that piece of it. And, and I'll share, this is something that the Apache Software Foundation does at its, because um, its board re meets monthly and reviews project updates, and they have about 30 <laughs> with each uh, board meeting to go through. Um, and so they don't read them out during the meeting. What they do is read everything ahead of time, and on each one in the agenda, give a, you know, a plus one for each of the board members who've read it. Um, and then, you know, if the report isn't accepted because it's, you know, blank or, or you know, uh, deficient in some way, then it becomes a topic of conversation. Um, so it's kind of exception handling rather than, you know, kind of the readout like we do. Um, so that was that was somewhat of the the inspiration for the the suggestion, um, uh, and it's a way to scale. Um, uh, and but it's not intended to take away the value of discussing some of the things like we've discussed today around fabric and indie uh, on a call like this. We're still small enough that I think we can have some lack, some looseness. Um, we just want to be efficient with everyone's time. So how would we flag that we want to have a discussion if we're if we're going to do that? <clears throat> I mean, the thing I like about Confluence is you can just leave comments and go, but it's different than an email list where you're going to see everyone else's comments. With Confluence, you sort of have to go back and and track it to see what other people have commented on. Right. Well, it'll be comments on the wiki. And you can either make them as like comments at the end of the page or even embedded. I mean, I think the idea is if it's short, you would embed it directly there. And it's so it's there in the agenda. <clears throat> and uh, um, obviously, if it's all green light, all plus ones across the board, no one has any any pushback, then you know you might go quickly <laughs> through that during the call or even just say, okay, everything looks good with fabric onto the next. Um, uh, uh, but if there is somebody who says, I want to talk about this or, or I think, this, you know, even though I'm plus one deserves a bit more attention, then, then it could pop up for discussion if the, those parties happen to be on the call. Mark, if you like, you can also subscribe to that page, in which case you will get all the message notifications that come through. Oh, It'll I'm, be a little bit annoying with all the plus ones, but you will still get notifications. It's not like you won't see any of the changes that happen. I've been getting a lot of notifications in the last few days. From <laughs> there's, there's, um, there are ways to go in and set your preferences so that you can get them in as digests instead. So uh, you don't have to like sit there and watch every single one. But there's, there's actually a lot of configuration tools in regards to notifications on Confluence. So I said Message filters are your friend. Yeah, I'm just on yes. vacation, so I keep popping up. I think maybe uh, another way to potentially handle it is rather than than having everyone plus one, perhaps we could just you know operate under the assumption that uh, if if you don't flag that you want to bring it up as a topic, then it's presumed that you've read it and and approved it. Um, so maybe that would clear up stuff. So it's really on the the onus is sort of on the TSE uh, members if they if they would like a discussion to uh, flag it as as they want to have a sort of a live discussion on it in the meeting. I I, I respectfully disagree with that. I think um, you know when I'm a good example of this, I think we're having enough problems writing the reports, let alone assuming everyone's going to read them. <laughs> your preference is to, uh, to, ha to have the assumption that we will have a discussion on it unless everyone has sort of said, this looks good, no need for uh, to have, well, a, have a discussion or report. Maybe I, miss, I misheard you. I thought you were saying just like no one had to plus one it, just assume everyone read it. So I, I think we need to plus one it. Yeah, okay. Let's not assume silence equals consent. No. Right. You know, okay, I misheard you then. I'm sorry. Yeah, not to be too passive about this. I um I, I would like to advocate us uh, still having a discussion. Um I uh, I see I see the benefits for scaling of not doing that. Um but I think maybe what we could say uh, is that rather than it being exhaustive run over the quarterly up update, which is certainly how I've kind of treated it in the past and initially. Uh, why don't we make it an opportunity uh, for the person giving the report, because I think it's nice that, to, to hear people's voice on the call, to bring up anything that is like a particular notable highlight. They don't have to go through it exhaustively, but we still actually get a bit of human verbiage. Um, and if it becomes a scaling problem, we, we could revisit it. 
maybe people will have nothing particular to add, but um, I, I'm all for maybe cutting down the time for a report, but I think it would be nice for us to default to having some words. Well, and you'll notice that from the indie side, I usually try to have a lot of folks to give the report. It's been a really good chance to introduce some of the other maintainers to the TSC, not only so that you guys can hear their voices, but also so that they understand what the TSC is doing and they know when to come and ask questions, which from our project standpoint has been really helpful. Yeah, that's a really good point. In fact, Sean is going to be giving the borough update next week. So. Okay, any other thoughts on uh, this topic from TSC members or others in the community? Okay, so I think uh, perhaps we can proceed with um, putting the plus one boxes on the future updates and then that will um, at least be a way to uh, sort of uh, signal that, that you have read it, but we'll still have folks come in uh, to provide any, any brief updates uh, and highlights that they would like. So do we want plus ones or do we just want me to put a checkbox on them so that they can check their names off? I think I, either works for me. I'm not sure if anyone else has an opinion. I, I'd quite like a checkbox. Um, I feel like it's a habit forming bit of pressure. To be honest, the checkbox are easier. <laughs> because then I can tell where they came from without having <laughs> <in> histories. <laughs> so that's why I'm pushing it. <clears throat> All right, great. Then we will proceed with a uh, checkbox and move forward in the agenda for today. Awesome. Uh, so Salon, would you like to talk about uh, some of these discussion topics? Yes, so um, <clears throat> working right now to kind of get the learning materials development group rebooted a bit. They've only got like three people attending the calls and the particip participation has been really low. And then we had the chair walk away for another job um, issue. And so trying to get another new chair up and going. Um, she did a bunch of documents and materials to help with the reboot, but then uh, she hasn't been able to make it to any of these phone calls. I think the time might be very inconvenient for her, but I'll check in with her again because we do have to, um, the TSC does approve that and we can't have a true election because like I said, only, you know, three members besides um, hyperledger staff are showing up. So um, looking at that in regards to how do we reboot that and all of that, but how do we also get the, TSC to encourage the projects to start sending representatives to it so that we can start looking at like what is the standards that we're looking at for learning materials for all of these development groups because as Nathan was talking about earlier those materials end up being key for the contribution portions so um, looking towards that uh, but like I said she's not here so um, I guess I'll get booted again till next week um, APAC boot camp going really well. Uh, sorry, just one one sure. quick question on that. Um, I thought that the, last week there was going to be um, an email to uh, the learning materials working group to see if, if anyone had any objections to uh, Bobby taking the chair role. Do, do you know if that went out and, and if there were any objections? I don't think it went out and I'll have to go check with Bobby on that one because I did talk to her about it. Um, so let me go circle back around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more comment on this, and I hate to sound negative, but you know, we we kind of predicted this might be a challenge, right? This work kind of competes with the efforts that are going on in each project to develop documentation, tutorials, and all. And you know, some of us try to warn <laughs> to warn us against that, and unfortunately, this seems to happen. Well, Arno, the, the, there was an ask that the projects have somebody on this community to make that connection direct and, and not be a competing effort. Um, so, no, no, but, and, and, you know, I don't mean competi competing in an adversarial way, right? It, it's, it's just because there's only so much one can do. And so, 
we have people involved in fabric uh, you know documentation and mm -hmm. tutorial development and and it's going to be hard to tell them but you should go help these folks too well, uh, well what we're what what bobby was talking about in regards to the reboot was it being very much more meta level and being able to basically um, help keep an eye on all of the projects and see how they're doing and what some people are doing as best practices and share that among all the different teams. So in a way, she was kind of pitching oh, okay. it as being more support group-like, I guess is a better way of putting it. So it's not redundant or competitive in any way. It's supposed to be complementary. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Welcome. If you go and check on um, the link there on the wiki, she kind of went and just like redid everything on the new wiki for it. So if you go in and look, you can sit there and see that it's more focused on that. And also being able to determine the um, health of those of that documentation. All right, I'll look. Thanks. And I'm sure fabric will be very healthy. It's, any other questions on the learning materials group? Okay, jump ahead to the boot camp. Um, the boot camp is extremely popular. I had to shut off registration, uh, and I'm working with events right now to figure out if we can hand, how many people we can actually handle within that space. Um, people are filling out their different proposals and we're getting that going. Julie and I have a separate spreadsheet where we're basically mentoring everyone through how to fill out the sessions. Um, and we're getting a really good look at the coverage like um, Caliper and Explorer and Ursa and Indy and Aroha and it's, it's, it's looking really good. So um, I'm very happy with that. I'm also happy with um, some of the stuff that's happening like with Nathan's group, for example, is they're looking at how do we create these materials so that they're reusable so that they can be used at future boot camps that we might not necessarily be throwing, but will be um, sponsoring. So uh, very happy with how that's progressing right now. Any questions? Okay, um, I, I did already get requests from the three different meetup organizers in that area as to when is the next one. Um, because they were are so thrilled with the format. The next one is the Contributor Summit. Um, I'm looking, uh, I was speaking with events about locations and dates. They advised me to look in Canada in September, October, uh, because they believe that um, May is too soon um, to find anything in Canada right now. She said that it was looking tight because they were already doing a bunch of research for several other LF projects. So um, they're kind of happy to be able to coordinate it for that time frame. And then also speaking with them about the next boot camps, which would be India and Brazil. And we're working on locations and dates for those as well. Will the Contributor Summit be linked up with the uh, general members summit like it not, was uh, no not currently we're looking at spacing those out um, mm -hmm. so that we basically have the three big ones which is the member summit the contributor summit and the global forum and so that's why I was kind of like looking at something separate also Japan is very expensive and I don't have a huge budget <laughs> So if I did that, I think I would blow through all my budget and wouldn't have things for boot camps. So that's another reason. All right, but if we're not going to the boot camp, then there's really nothing on the radar till September or October. Is you mean other than the summit? Well, a member summit's usually in <clears throat> later in the year. Do you have a sense for when other boot camps are happening? I thought you had said there was one in Denver possibly coming up. Well, no. So the other boot camps that are happening are a bit later. So there's um, Denver, um, the 
the um, Canadian government and DEF CON. <clears throat> and those are all in the August, September timeframe currently. Okay, so there, <clears throat> if, if uh, somebody wanted to pull together a boot camp earlier, um, and, and I'm hoping to pull the, together the India and Brazil before that, but I'm not sure yet. I have to figure out the, the dates and the locations for it. Okay. Maybe Red Hat is space in uh, Mark? <laughs> but to Mark's point, that there is no contributors summit before the fall. It seems a bit strange because this is supposed to replace the hack phase, which you know, at some point it was over killing, but we were meeting like every other month and we shifted towards more like once a quarter and now it's like, what, once a year? Yeah, I mean, as, as has been discussed before, the idea of the, the hack fest, you, you know, nothing obviously keeps us from getting together more frequently, but, uh, but to divide kind of the dual nature of the hack fest of being both a core contributor kind of gathering um, and something that would onboard new users as contributors to kind of divide that into two different events because the culture is really different on those two. <clears throat> and we would still welcome, uh, we still really need maintainers and core contributors uh, when they can to show up at the boot camps. Um, but in terms of requiring um, or really, really saying it's really important to be there face to face, I, th I think through conversation conversation and, and, uh, and implicit in this is it's really unreasonable to ask people, ask developers who work for, you know, startups who work for or otherwise kind of, you know, self-sufficient to travel the world four times a year to be face to face. Um, and so once a year contributor summit, I think that's a reasonable ask. Um, uh, that's, that was, that was the reason for this kind of bifurcation of the, the Hackfest concept into those two. So Brian, when I wrote up the Contributor Summit, I did write it up for being held twice a year or more frequently if the community thought it needed it. Um, oh, okay. So I, I mean, yeah, I, I guess the September date is what's causing concern here. Okay, well, why don't we just take, take it offline for Solana and I to look at other options for earlier in the year, but, but you know, planning these things and asking people to make travel commits and such does require a lead time of, you know, several months anyway. So let's see what we can do. But um, I, I, I think we're converging on this. Um, and, and if there are other ways that we can pull together core contributors face to face, you, you know, before then, for those who can make it, we can see about doing that. And I'm not opposed to twice a year for a contributor summit. I think there's just a, it's just, you know, asking people to travel is always a big lift, right? Um, and we were doing that a lot before. And I think that limited the critical mass at any given Hackfest. Well, I think, I think to that point, it may make sense to um, also look at in, at in the future, having it be sort of coincident with the global forum or the member summit, you know, if that was a few days before or after, uh, then it's, you know, you get kind of two for the price of one. Uh, so that can often be easier for folks traveling if it was maybe a couple days before or a couple days after. Uh, I'm not sure what folks' thoughts are, but but then it could be sort of tacked on to some of these other events, but on a smaller scale, uh, which which gives folks the ability to attend more of the broader community as well as the, the maintainers piece. Yeah, I like that idea. I mean, part of it is the monetary cost of travel the other is just the physical toll of you know going to china for two for two days of meeting and then coming back versus going you know to china for a week or something is much easier on the body especially old ones i agree with uh with what everybody's saying here if we you know attaching these to places we already have to be is not too much of a challenge at least for attendance. Okay, Solana, let's let's also talk about Japan then. I know okay. budgets a budgets a concern, but um, and we assume that'd be a concern for other people as well. But um, maybe there's I don't know some onsen in the mountains that's cheaper or something like that. <laughs> 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 We're having it in a park. <laughs> or a university in Tokyo who might be interested in hosting or something like that. That's 
the biggest problem with universities is their layouts. That's, I know, I know. We have we have had challenges when we've tried to use creative space, as anyone who was in uh, Lisbon remembers that. Um, <laughs> but I think we're all lucky we didn't <laughs> die in Lisbon. <laughs> Although hey. if you're going to die in a European city, Lisbon is great to die in. But um, yeah. Hyperledger Ursa was born in the back of a bus. It's the Ramblin' Project. That was a pretty far out creative space. <laughs> Are there any other agenda topics? I don't want to soak up all the time. There's things that are backlogged um, on some of that, but uh, I think I can probably actually get rid of the waiting for submittal of the project from the interop. Someone suggested that they wanted to do it, but then they haven't followed through after I asked them to do up a proposal. Um, <clears throat> and then there was talk of about a fabric desktop proposal, but I'm not familiar with that yet. Yeah, and Tom, Kelly, you said that that was gone to be proposed as a feature to the Fabric project? That's that's correct. That was the last discussion was that uh, they were going to bring that project to uh, the Fabric maintainers. Um, I haven't heard any uh, progress on that. Um, so if anyone is on from uh, the Hyperledger Fabric maintainers uh, and has any context on that, uh, that would be great as well. And then there was a little bit more discussion about the role of lab st stewards, but I'm not exactly sure where that is either. Um, I, I guess, Tr Tracy, you have background? So that was actually the role of the lab sponsor. Um, sponsors, okay. Yes, yeah, sponsors. So um, I think the lab stewards had agreed to what that tech should be, but we never brought it back to the TSC. Okay, so I need to go get that from there and bring it forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for that and I can send it out to the TSC. Awesome, thank you. It was I, brought to the TSC, if I remember. Yeah, we brought it and then we, we had an action item to, to go back and talk about it. There was pushback. Yeah, so I think, I think <laughs> we came to a conclusion, but I don't think we ever came back to the TSC with it. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, quite a spirited discussion. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was pushback from some, some people about that, uh, uh, having uh, the um, Linux Foundation employees be able to uh, sponsor projects. Yeah, there were two aspects. There was that came up, and then there was the question of, you know, what exactly is expected from sponsors because there are people who were hesitant to sign up as sponsors because they didn't know what they were signing up. <laughs> and it appears that some of us have a fairly low expectation about the role. It's mostly about endorsement. This is my view, at least. And others, I think Dan, you know, thought that it should be technical people who really are engaged with the project and kind of follow it and whatnot. So... That's well, uh, I, I mean, there was that, but uh, in the end, I thought we did reach a decision that it would be the low touch approach that, uh, that has prevailed uh, in terms of the sponsors. Uh, the sponsors are a initial gating factor, meaning that they would look at the proposal and see whether it's, it meets the requirements for a lab that it's actually uh, something that is uh, 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 narrow enough in scope and appropriate for the labs. I mean, this this was my feeling that we all already decided on it. We can go back to those uh, audio uh, audio files to look at them, or we can, of course, open the reopen the discussion. No, no, but I, I agree with you. I think we we eventually got to that point, and then. We just have to write it down and put it before the TSC to say, okay, we approve it and then record that and update the documentation accordingly. I think what we agreed to is, you know, the, the what is required is fairly minimal, but then there's a bunch of things, you know, how much in, involved people want to be. Of course, anybody is free to get very involved in the lab. That's true for sponsors as much as anyone else for that matter. Uh, that's like Nick, uh, Mick uh, in the 
private data objects. I mean, he seems to be doing most of the commits. I'm doing most of the what? <laughs> work. No, I mean, I, oh, no, yeah. There are four of us that are doing commits there, so pretty regularly. You're heavily involved. I'm sorry. Oh, if you're pay, asking pay. me if I'm heavily involved, the answer is um, yes. Okay. <laughs> not, I'm not asking you. I know that you're heavily involved because I get updates mm -hmm. for every commit you do. Good. You're going to offer a couple of your own? Maybe if I have time. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> that sucking sound is coming. Well, we're at two minutes to the end of the meeting. Um, I don't know if there's, was there a proposal on the table related to role of lab, of the lab sponsors? No, no. So the action item is we have to go back and dig up the text that we had started putting together. I don't know if it's final or not. And then we'll come back to the TSC with the, the text as a formal proposal to be approved. Okay. And with that, it looks like we've cleared the backlog. That's terrific. <laughs> Fantastic. Are there any other uh, opens or questions before we adjourn? All right. Uh, thanks for everyone's time today, and uh, we will talk next week.